Hello everyone and welcome back to the analysis by Vajiram and Ravi dated 9th of July. By the end of this discussion you will learn good details about the current affair articles derived from the Hindu and Indian Express. You should also know that the first three articles are highly important for the upcoming mains 2024 examination. So the articles are as follows. In the first one we will analyze the militancy situation in Jammu and Kashmir and how does it impose a threat to the internal security of India which is a part of GS3 part of the syllabus. In the second one we will read about the bilateral relation between two indispensable allies that is India and Russia. Then we will understand the need and the challenges for creating affordable healthcare system in India. Then we will briefly understand what is the organ transplantation scenario in India and how the deficit of the same is leading to emergence of some of the scams. Then do you know what are white goods and do you know that there is also a PLI scheme for the same? Well, we will be reading that as well. And finally, we will wind up the discussion by reading very interesting film snippets, highly important for the prelims examination. So stay tuned. Now our first topic is the main headline of the day. Here we are going to read about the entire militancy scenario of Jammu and Kashmir and how it poses threat to the internal security of India. This is very relevant for the GS3 part of the syllabus. The context why it has made the headline is that about five army jawans have been killed and unfortunately six have been injured in a military ambush between army vehicle and the militants in the Badnota, Badnota which is near Katwa of Jammu. So in order to understand this entire militancy scenario, let me take you back to the place where the separatist ideologies and the militant ideologies started getting penetrated into the region of Jammu and Kashmir. So as you all know that in 1947 when India got independent, when India got independent in 1947 that is when the princely states were given two options either to go with the Indian dominion or with the Pakistani dominion. The other princely states did take a side but some of the princely states like Jammu and Kashmir forbade to do that. Raja Hari Singh was a ruler at that time and he forbade to take any sides. Very soon he got himself into a crisis situation where some of the Pakistani tribesmen aided by the Pakistani military attacked the region of Jammu and Kashmir to claim their possession. Now for this Raja Hari Singh goes back to the Indian government for security support and for that he signed the instrument of accession. The moment he did that, Indian government promised to provide him the military support. The problem with the situation is that for the first time now, the valley of Jammu and Kashmir will get infiltrated by, first of all, the Pakistani soldiers, Pakistani military person and the Indian military person. So basically, this is a starting phase of when the zone is getting militarized. Because it is getting militarized and a lot of heavy casualties will be taking place, the region of ceasefire will be violated a lot many times and therefore this results to emergence of separatist ideologies. This separatist ideology was there but not to say that it had militant ideologies. Militant ideologies only came after two decades of a very peaceful Jammu and Kashmir had started and it in fact began from 1989. So what happened, please understand, because of these separatist ideologies, a lot of Islamic groups started coming up because they were very infuriated of the governance, the misgovernance that was happening in Jammu and Kashmir. They felt disenfranchised, they felt lack of representation was there, they felt that local autonomy was taken away from them and as a result of this, they wanted to gain the political power. So therefore, a lot of Islamic groups started organizing themselves and they organized themselves into one single group in order to contest the upcoming election and this is known as Muslim United Front. This Muslim United Front is the one which you very famously now known, know as the Hurriyat group. Now what happened when they contested the election they had this one manifesto. They said that when we will come into the power we will disregard the constitution of India and rather we will obey the Islamic laws given by the Quran. Now when the result when the election happened they secured 31% of the total seats, 31% of the total votes, but they only afford to secure four seats in the Legislative Assembly of Jammu and Kashmir, which infuriated them more. And eventually, this political organization of Hurriyat will now get converted into the first ever militant organization of Jammu and Kashmir. And this is where you will start seeing the militant activities. Militant activities has already sprouted up. It will now get aggravated because of multiple situations. First of all, foreign alliance and support, for example, by some of the Pakistani and some of the other international support groups like ISI supported it. There were 
terrorism nexus between the administrative machineries, the political machineries, the, the extra uh, national securities as well. And therefore, all of them, all of them aggravated the militant situation over there. Now, you already know that this situation is heavily militarized, more so because now the militants have started coming in the place and therefore this will also require deployment of more number of armed forces and military forces, which means when a lot of militarization is happening, it can be said that a lot of human, human right violations must have also started taking place and it was the reality of the day. A lot of human right violations started taking place which infuriated and frustrated especially the youth and the marginalized sections of the Jammu and Kashmir. Because they were not having any proper venting channel, they eventually resorted to developing into themselves as overground worker or as militant, taking part in the militancy group itself. Therefore, it bolstered the militancy in Jammu and Kashmir. Not to forget the economic and developmental factors of Jammu and Kashmir. Please understand that the topography of Jammu and Kashmir is a very hilly terrain, which means it is not very conducive for developing infrastructure of health, of education, of other employment, for example, creating industries, etc. So from where will this youth energy come from or where will it get directed to obviously to the unproductive task in order to accomplish their goals and that was of course to join a militancy group from the graph given over here you can obviously notice that there was a spike high record high militant militancy observed during these decades of 1991 to 2003. This was the time when the militancy was peaking in the region of Jammu and Kashmir. Now, you must also know that it also got amalgamated with some of the ethnic clashes, ethnic clashes between the Hindus and the Muslims occupying the regions of Jammu and Kashmir. How and why two major events took place. First, first and foremost, the, the Kashmiri Pandit exodus of 1990. So what happened? They were forcibly removed, they were violated, many people were raped and a, a lot of violence were put over them and therefore they were moved away from their land. The second one was the Anantnag land transfer case. What was this case? About 99 acre of the land which was surrounding the Amarnath shrine that was given directly, handed over directly to the Hindu people. This infuriated the Muslim regions of that area and therefore that this further started up the clashes. So basically the militancy of Jammu and Kashmir is a resultant of many factors. We have got historical factors. We have read about the political factors, organization of Hurriyat. We have understood uh, uh, we have understood some of the other factors, for example, infrastructure or developmental factors. Some of the ethnic factors have contributed to it and not to forget the intervention, intervention of external support has also been very instrumental in supporting the militancy in Jammu and Kashmir. If you talk about some of the important prominent groups that have been there performing the militancy in Jammu Kashmir, they are lashkar e taiba lashkar e taiba which is basically responsible for a lot many attacks assume the responsibility of attack that happened in last year in the riyasi district uri district srinagar etc so that was lashkar e taiba a lot of militancy activities uh, these days in this particular decade is performed by them only next is jesh e mohammed this was instrumental in the pulwama attack pulwama attack of 2017 if you remember then harkat e mujahideen harkat e mujahideen was responsible for a lot of air strikes air attacks uh, so basically which happened in the decade of 1990s so these were the three major prominent group but now kashmir is also seeing more secular undertone of the militant groups these are the tiger the Kashmiri Tigers, the resistant forces, which have got more secularized approach because they are not wanting, they are not demanding jihad to take place, rather they want development to take place, rather they want the ownership of the Kashmir for the ethnic people. So these are some of the prominent group which you can very much quote in your examination. You can also take the support of these notable insurgencies for your mains exam. You can quote the Kashmiri Pandit exodus that happened in 1990, the Uri attack, the Pulwama attack of 2017, in order to cite some of the major militant attacks of Jammu and Kashmir, right? You should also know that nowadays overground worker is another menace for the security of Jammu and Kashmir because the civilians are taking more part are becoming more participant in the militant activity as compared to the external agents. So therefore, rise of civilian recruitment can be seen of up to 100% from 2014 to 2020. This is the changing nature of Jammu and Kashmir militancy, which is also known as the hybrid warfare, where civilians are more active than the external agents in causing militant activities. Now, how to deal with it and how to walk towards a peaceful framework?
what do we need to do first of all to have a very important surveillance a very active efficient surveillance network is to have immediate and very efficient counter incidency operations to also aid and develop some of the infrastructures that can improve the standard of living of the people for example providing them living providing them employment opportunity providing them skills trainings etc especially to the youth then we would also require some kind of dialogue and peaceful framework we would also require to change the narrative of the kashmiri people regarding the india they should not be holding the ideology of us versus them we should integrate them into the oneness of india so all these factors when combined together will give us the proper strategies to deal with the militancy not just in the short term but also in the longer run let's have a quicker and a deeper look into all of them first of all is the operation all out so any time a militant attack takes place in jammu and kashmir indian army immediately responds in the form of operation all out this is one of the most efficient counter insurgency operation to neutralize the militant activities second is to have interlocutors who can have informal and formal dialogue and peace talks with the neighbors or with the countries which can be contributing into our militancy situation next is performing economic development which is the prime need of the hour we need to develop employment we need to provide skill training to them we need to provide them more avenues for health care for for education etc so for that udan initiative has been a good initiative by the government of jammu and kashmir udan initiative is basically responsible for providing skill training and an employment opportunity for the youth of jammu and kashmir next is to deploy security measures and these are preventive in nature to have effective surveillance in place to have additional to troops deployed to have improved intelligence sharing mechanisms so that we can catch the bird before it flies next is community engagement is the need of the hour so that the civilians don't get militarized or do, they don't get radicalized so for that we have operation sadbhavna in operation sadbhavna change in narrative among the people of jammu and kashmir is the main target of the government of india so that they feel more oneness with the indians next is the revocation of article 370 further developed the local autonomy by providing for some of the district development councils this is one of the main grievances faced by the jammu and kashmir people so it was a good way forward towards integrating them into india and also empowering them uh, on to local levels next is anti radicalization efforts this is sahi rasta it is a 21 day training campaign by the indian army where they pull in the jammu kashmir people especially the youth of jammu and kashmir and they train them so that their energies can be harnessed into helping the indian army and not into militant groups and then realization of the soft border concept hard borders are the main sources of conflict are the main regions of conflict in order to dilute them can we create soft borders which can facilitate the movement of freed people and transport yes we can and one example of this is the shrinagar muzaffarabad a uh, bus service which is already working so this will provide a soft border and easier movement of people right then countering the narrative is the main thing because if the people can only be radicalized with the help of false narrative which is even more prominent in the in the generation of fourth industrial revolution where we have got ai and such other important and very dangerous tools so with the help of this ai only we will be able to detect such narratives we will be able to block the narratives that can hinder the security and sovereignty of the country we can also rebuild the narratives with the help of same technologies and all of this will eventually lead to the solution of jammu and kashmir militancy in both short term and long term a real friend is the one who walks in when rest of the world walks out such has been the story of india and russia relationship so in this context the context where pm modi has chose russia for his first bilateral visit after assuming the charge into the new government has made us to analyze the india russia indispensable friendship ties this is important from gs paper 2 point of view where we have to read about the bilateral relations you must also know that india and russia are going to have 22nd bilateral summit 22nd indo russian bilateral summit and this is the first time ever after the after the russia ukraine war so this is what makes this particular topic very relevant for the mains 2024 so let's have a deeper analysis first of all to start with what are the areas in which we convert strategically the first and the very important one especially for india is the strategic significance with regards to defense the dependence of india on russia 
with regards to its defense armor is more as compared to any other country. If you look into this chart itself, you will be able to observe that about 65% of the defen defense imports that the India procures is directly coming from Russia itself. So Russia basically is the largest is the largest exporter of defense products to us. Not only that, if you talk about the tanks that India owns, a lot of them like tank 29th, tank 21 are the Russian tanks. If you talk about some of the aerial defense products that we have, for example, the MIG version aircraft, for example, the Sukhoi, for example, some of the very famous missiles like, can you name one? There is Brahmos and the second one also asked by UPSC in the mains exam, the S-400 Triumph missile. All of them are a joint venture of India and Russia itself. Then if you talk about at the naval level, then the submarines, the submarines that India owns, more than 50% of them are from Russian origin. So this makes us understand the heavy reliance on each other with regards to defense infrastructure. And this was uh, given the light of the day via a military technical alliance treaty that was signed between India and Russia back in 2000. Now, the second aspect is our economic convergence, our trade and investment convergence. Well, India is Russia's seventh largest trading partner. In fact, the trade between us has seen an exponential growth rate. We were targeting that by 2030, we should strike a bilateral trade. By 2025, we should strike a bilateral trade of $25 billion USD. We have already surpassed this target with scoring about $45 billion worth trade. That too, by just 2023. So we have got a very promising trade relations as well. Next is the energy security. Russia is one of those countries which has got one of the largest sources of natural gas, especially in the far eastern part of Russia. And this holds a great interest for Indian energy security as well. So we are one of the finest, one of, we are one of the largest importers of natural gas from Russia, which first of all aids our internal secure energy security. And second of all, it also ensures that we are going to transition towards a lower carbon footprint economy. The second aspect is the development of some other renewable energy alternatives, for example, the nuclear power plant. Have you heard about the Kundan Kulam power plant of Tamil Nadu? Well, that is getting developed by the Aden Alliance of Russia only. So they are very important for us transitioning towards a lower carbon footprint economy and also ensuring energy security. Then we have been enduring partners since decades back. If you see our relationship, we have been collaborating during the time of Cold Wars also during the Cold Era. The second and the very instrumental moment was seen when nobody was there with India, especially the superpowers like USA and UK, they sided with the Pakistan during the 1971 war that was struck between India and Pakistan. At that time, at that time, US militarized the Bay of Bengal region and UK militarized the western coast of India. It was only Russia who did a deal with us. This was known as the India-Soviet Friendship Peace Treaty that was signed in 1971 by Nikita, who was the Prime Minister of Russia and by Indira Gandhi, Prime Minister of India. Both of them signed this treaty which said that any attack on India would be deemed as an attack on Russia. And as a result, it was only Russia, one of the only prominent powers which supported us. Not only that, Russia has also been very instrumental in helping us to achieve or to enhance our ideology of multipolarity because Russia is also one of the believers in that. In fact, Russia has been one of the profound supporters of us in getting the membership of NSG, Nuclear Suppliers Group, in also getting us the membership of the permanent member in the United Nations Security Council. So Russia has been helping us throughout. So therefore, a friend in need is a friend indeed. But there are certain challenges which are plaguing the relationships between India and Russia of late. Let us have an analysis on the same. First of all, it's a strategic crossroads for Russia. So the case with Russia is that it shares one of the longest borders with China. So inherently, it cannot directly have opposition or attacks on the China just because it wants to side with India. 
So therefore, what Russia does, it offers a lot of diplomatic engagement, defense engagements, economic engagements and partnerships with China as well, which could be a problematic case for India when it wants the Russia to take strong stance against the border violations caused by China. That's the first thing. Second thing, when Russia sees that we are growing our closeness with the USA, that prompts them to grow their closeness with Pakistan and China, which are our adversaries. So we are currently standing at a strategic crossroads. Second thing is the diplomatic dilemma for the India, whether to take the side of USA or whether to take the side of Russia. In fact, during the Ukrainian crisis also, India was heavily condemned. Why? Because it did not take a side whether it wants to condemn Russia or not, because it also wanted to have a diplomatic relationship with its one of the most prominent friends, that is Russia. Now, this diplomatic dilemma starts with its engagement from United Nations. Now, United Nations generally attacks Russia with a lot of sanctions. India, therefore, has created a lot of military arrangements with United States as well bypassing Russia in many cases, for example, Quad. Then Ukrainian crisis, during the Ukrainian crisis, when a lot of sanctions were being imposed on the Russia oil, especially the Russia, uh, Russian oil and the Russian other imports, at that time, India was in dilemma whether they should be heavily reliant on import or whether they should try to diversify their Im import basket, basket to other countries. Now, talking about the declining economic engagement, we know that we are the seventh largest trading partner, but at the same time, this economic engagement is heavily declining. The amount of imports that we are bringing and purchasing from Russia because of the factors like sanctions on them, because of the factors like uh, over-reliance and lack of proper servicing after the, after the product is issued to us, all of these factors have led to decline in the import engagement between Russia and India. You can see clearly from the chart over here, Russia's import is declining heavily with respect respect to India as compared to China and USA, right? So what can we do to force the stronger ties? First and foremost is to bolster the defense arena. We know that we are procuring a lot many things, but why not create a manufacturing base in the India itself with the help of Russia? So that can be done. Second is diversification of the economic ties. If you look into this graph, you'll be able to observe that yes, we import a lot from Russia, but mostly what? Mostly the crude oil, mostly the fertilizers, mostly the petroleum byproducts. What about the other things? What about the other precious metals, coal, coal by fertilizers, etc.? We are not procuring them at an equal pace. So this basically is something which we can deal with. This is something how we can diversify our economic ties. When you talk about the exports from India towards Russia, you will be able to see marine products and bulk drugs are the only ones which are still gaining grounds in Russia. Other than that, all the other have fallen down. Iron and Steel, Telecom, Russia has chosen some other partners to procure it. So we need to really fix up these economic ties. Next is balancing the global dynamics. We already have certain multilateral engagement forums. For example, we have got G20, we have got SCO, Shanghai Cooperation Organization, we've got BRICS. So why not come together and bring an alliance which can eventually further up the idea of multipolarity. Next is innovation and technological cooperation is the need of the art because both of these countries, India has got a lot of skill power, manpower, Russia has got a lot of technological advancements. Both of us can come together and leverage technology in many areas, for example, energy security, defense, etc. Next is promoting the cultural connectivity. Do you know that yoga as a practice is very, very famous in Russia? So with the help of such human engagement, cultural activities, with the help of interchange academias, we can bolster our cultural connectivity. This will help us to leverage ground in improving the narratives that are getting generated between both the countries. And this will help us to forge even better ties with our best friend, that is Russia. Now, as the budget is around the corner, the topic which is gaining ground is the provision of affordable healthcare in India. So we shall be analyzing all the prospects from the means point of view. Very important in GS paper too, because we cover health in the entire coverage. Next, what is the context? The context is that the editorial, this particular article features up that low public spending implies that there will be high out-of-pocket expenditure by the households which is almost record high in terms of India. So we shall have a deeper analysis into the same. First of all, let me tell you the gravity of the situation to understand the need of affordable care. Do you know that India is one among those countries which invests the least from its GDP into the health domain? If you look into this chart, you will be able to observe that at least among the BRICS nation, we hold the last bottom. 
naturally if health which is actually a public good is not getting investments from the public domain then what will happen majority of the burden will be given on to the private players or into the private spending this private spending mostly comes from where it comes from out of pocket expenditure from the pockets of the people most of them who are not even insured these are known as the the missing middle about 30% of the total middle class is not even insured which incurs them more of out of pocket expenditure now first of all we understood that we are quite very low very much low on the total public spending and therefore lot of very high on out of pocket expenditure now if you may ask how much part of our gdp is actually chunked out for the health expenditure it is only 3.5% of the gdp it is only 3.5% of the gdp as compared to other nations for example china usa they spend as much as 7 to 10% of the gdp into health sector the problem is not just this problem is the overall spending the 3.5% of the healthcare spending out of this only 1.35 comes from the public healthcare it comes from the public exchequer and therefore the rest is obviously coming from the private expenditure that is from the out of pocket expenditure the goal of the government is basically to enhance it up to 2.5% of the total portion of the gdp but that is still not something which has been realized yet and we are living in an era where we are going to have one of the highest population across the world right this also gets augmented by the rising economic adversities you must have heard about the demonetization that happened the gst reforms which kind of wrecked the msme sector the middlemen the small people the small farmer especially these economic adversities along with the covid crisis it further exacerbated the expenditure from their pockets so much so that they started borrowing from the medical for their medical bills if you talk about the ruler segments the ruler segment about 13.4% of them they borrowed for their medical bill and 8.5% of the total urban population borrowed for the medical bill which further aggravates their economic situation now therefore a lot of such households in fact according to a survey that was done in 2022 it was found that because of the adversities related to covid about 70 to 80 million people of the india went directly below the poverty line why because of the rising out of pocket expenditure which is one among the highest in the brics countries next is the rising burden of the ncds that is a non communicable diseases right now india is marked with 60% of the patients which are suffering from the non communicable diseases which are which are for example tb for example cancers now they take long time to be prevented to be curated and as a result the short term fundings will not be good enough for them we need to make consistent and resilient effort in order to put a particular chunk of or a particular leverage of money into each and every year's health budget so in order to take into account of these uh, ncds we also need to have appropriate budget allocation next is the insufficient funding we already know that this is happening not just from the central government side but also from the state government side where central government is spending less than 4% of the total gdp on healthcare sector state governments who were told to demarcate 8% of the state gdp because health is of course a state subject they only limited it up to 3 to 4% in fact for some states like bihar it was even less than 3% and 2% so this is the gravity of the situation hence we what we require we require healthcare because health is the most important prerogative for living for providing the very basic human right to anybody and therefore what are the measures that we need what are the interventions that we need and what are the government policies in place for them we will have a discussion on that first and foremost is to reduce the health disparity do you know that about 75% of the population who are heavily ridden by out of pocket expenditure are belonging from the scheduled caste the scheduled tribes and the pvtg communities these are the people who already cannot afford it and therefore definitely cannot offer uh, offer healthcare services for themselves as well therefore in order to reduce this disparity to some extent we have got ayushman bharat which is going to cater the bottom 40% of the population next is 
the national healthcare mission which is going to reduce the disparity of the healthcare provisions between the urban sectors and the rural sectors next is the public and private collaboration in order to enhance the amount of resources we have for our medical facilities so for this for providing preventive education for workforce development for infrastructure enhancement and not just that for enhancing the awareness and outreach we would require collision with private governments and private government agencies both of them next is the international inventions for example the gavi alliance for example who taking a lot of leads all of these institutions can come together and provide better healthcare augmentation services fundings to countries for example india who are marred by deficit of funding in healthcare sector then technological intervention is the need of the hour so that we can provide more number of healthcare benefits to larger number of people with lesser number of investment that can be done with the help of ai tools robotics etc next is enhancing the budgetary allocation it is said that we should be able to uh, increase it to up to 5% in order to deal with the rising population and the rising amount of disease in the country in order to do this government has provided a number of schemes and these number of schemes can be listed as the national health mission both urban component and rural component ayushman bharat also known as jan arogya mission which is there not just for the curative healthcare but also for preventive healthcare then national medical commission is there national dialysis program is there shishu kalyan and bal swasthya karyakram is also there these are some of the provisions which will be very instrumental in providing us affordable healthcare now let me quickly brief you about the organ transplant racket that has recently been revealed in apollo hospital of delhi because recently apollo hospital was held for the bangladesh india transplant racket that was going on so basically some migrants and refugees from bangladesh who were coming to india they were lured for money in lieu of their organs they were not even duly paid for the same and this led to creation this led to creation of a huge racket network which is recently busted off so this is the reason why we are reading about the organ transplant situation see why rackets are taking place rackets are happening because there is a dire scarcity of the organs which are required in order to make people alive and also this is a very highly money holding and money propelling business why because for one organ a person gets to have a lot of money the only thing is now they are getting duly unexploited for the same now please understand that when we talk about the organ donation scenario in india india which has got one of the largest population in the world is also holding the position of third rank in the total number of transplantations that is happening anywhere across the world so therefore the problem here is the deficit between demand and supply the demand is skyrocketing when it comes to organ demands in india but at the same time the supply is decreasing if i talk about the supply side case scenario first of all there is critical shortage because there is though there is growth in the number of donors but it is not in promotion it is not in proportion with the growing number of demand which is very exponential as compared to the rising number of donors the donors that that are actually giving the transplants or actually giving the organs are mostly belonging to the living category as compared to the deceased category if you talk about the deceased there's only 1 in million when you talk about the living donor the total number of donors that are there 85% are unfortunately living in nature that is the nature of organ transplantation scenario in india and if you talk about the demand about 3 lakh patient are on the waiting list not just indians but also foreigners because of the affordable transplantations that are performed in india if you talk about the data to support your argument of organ transplantation you can see that there has been a rise a rise of about 200% in the total organ transplants that have taken place in india since the last 10 years the deceased organ transplants have increased but the most amount of increase have been there for the living organ transplants now you must also know that because of the shortage 20 people are dying daily and also kidney transplants are generally something which is which is very much highly in demand and therefore not duly substantiated with the supply so therefore it is met only with 1000 transplants upon the 2 lakh cases of demand in case of kidney kidney being the most transplanted organ over there therefore this is a particular organ which is highly racketed so you must have also read about a lot of cash for kidney scam next is the regional disparities that is observed when i talk about the people who are donating whether they are dead or whether they are alive in terms of alive segment north india north india wins and in the case of deceased organ donors south india wins so there is a huge disparity again 
Now, talking about which of the organs can be donated, this is something which is very important for enhancing our general knowledge. It's not just our kidneys, it's not just the liver, it's not just basically the lungs and the heart and the eyes which can be prominently donated, but also the veins, the pancreas, the intestines, the bones and even the skin can also be donated. This is for uh, enhancing the awareness of transplantation. Now, talking about the regulations for the organ donation in India. The first regulatory mechanism and authority was put forward by the Transplantation of Humans, Humans Organ and Tissues Act of 1994, after which National Organ, organ Transplantation Program started in 2014, which basically created a national registry of all the people who are donating the organs, the transplantation centers and their details. And it also called for holding a national awareness program for organ donation in order to enhance the number of organ donations in India. It is celebrated every year in November 27th. The deceased people and their organ donation program was also created in 1974. Back then, it was just less than 5% and now because of this awareness program, it has gone up to 17%. We also have got Organ Retrieval Banking Organization, which is basically there, situated in Ames Valley, for preserving the organs, right? So that they do not get foiled and wasted. Last but not the least is a National Organ Transplantation Guideline, very recently issued in 2023, which says that there can be multiple ways of enhancing the organ donation. First of all, from the donor side and second from the receptor side. The receptor previously could only ask for organ donation up to some extent of age. Some upper limit was there. Now this upper age cap for registering to receive the organ has been removed. Now anybody can avail for organs. Next is it has removed the domicile requirement. Basically, in line of the One Nation, One Policy, anybody from any part of the country can come and donate the organ to any recipient. Last but not the least, no registration piece is there for registering, for donating the organ or for receiving the organ, for facilitating this entire process. If these regulations are really implemented in pen, letter and spirit, only then we will be able to do away with some of the menaces, for example, the rackets and the scams, which are causing major threat to the human rights. And now let's do the policy analysis of the production linked incentive scheme for the white goods. The context is that government has pronounced to reopen the PLI scheme for white goods till October 12, which means the registration can come till October 12. This is very important from Maine's point of view, but also from Prelim's point of view, because this is a very important policy. Now, talking about the white goods, what are white goods? So, first of all, what are white goods? White goods are typically large electrical appliances which you can find in your living room. Basically, the air conditioner, the dry cleaners, the washing machines. Let's say we have uh, some electric stoves or the kitchen stoves, all of these which are electrical appliances, electrical in nature and traditionally used to be white in color are known as white goods. Do not confuse them with some of the other electronic goods, for example, your TV and your radios and your computers, etc. because they are known as the brown goods. So here we are going to talk about white goods and how India can bring its value into the global value or the global supply chain of the white goods. This is with the help of PLI. Now, first of all, how much amount of FDI is permitted into, P into the white goods sector? The amount of uh, FDI is 100% and that too via automatic route. This is permitted by the government of India, which has led to robust growth in the white good industry. Estimated market value has gone up to 13.66 billion US dollars and the growth rate has accounted up to 11% per year. Now, in order to further up the manufacturing industry in the white goods segment, government has introduced white goods segment into the very important and very promising PLI production linked incentive scheme. In this particular scheme, government calls not just for the national players, but also the international players. For example, Daikin is there. For example, Daikin, for example, Havels, for example, Cisco, for example, Panasonic. So they can also come and now promote and ensure manufacturing into our soil. So this is the idea of PLI and how does government promote it or how does it support it? It supports by incentivizing the incremental sales. 
so only when the sales are incremental in nature only then government will be supporting them and this is also obviously led to leverage into a lot of promising industries the sunrise industries for example the pharma industry for example the electronics industry etc because of the pli intervention talking about the pli uh, scheme broadly so this was launched in the year 2020 by the government of india to improve the efficiency foster economies of scale within the manufacturing sector so this is not for the service sector this is not for the agriculture sector this is for the manufacturing sector the total outlay has been given up to nearly 2 trillion dollars and this is for 13 to 14 key sector initially when it was launched in 2020 it was only limited to three sectors but now expanded up to 14 promising sectors for example it is for mobiles automobile solar pvs for pharmaceuticals for acc battery even textile even bulk drugs specialty steel white good and drone technology as well so all of them will be the beneficiary of pli talking about pli scheme and white good specifically it is approved by the cabinet in 2021 for the next seven years it will help make india an integral part of the global supply chain regarding the white good production the domestic value addition because we as a country have got the third largest demand of the white goods in the entire world so therefore the domestic value addition will also happen it is expected to grow from the current 15 percent to about 75 percent in the near future this is the agenda of pli scheme now in the prelim snippet section we will be looking into the udaygiri cave recently visited by our honorable president then we will be looking into heti republic then we will see what is the HPV vaccine then we will look into the special mention accounts part 2. In the first one we are going to cover the Udaygiri Khan Giri case a lesser known but very astonishing case from Odisha. Udaygiri caves were created in 2nd century BC by the Kharvel king by the Kharvel king of Odisha belonging to the Meghavahana dynasty. The glory of these caves are such that they have a lot many caves arranged in a double storied structure and they are located in the Udaygiri hills and about 200 from 200 meters from here is the Khangiri cave so both of them are simultaneously situated near to each other you must have read about the Hathi Gumpha inscription of the Kharvela king it is found here only you must have read about the Kalinga story the Kalinga war story most of the inscriptions of the same is found in the Udaygiri caves itself talking about the cave it has housed not only the Buddhist monks but also the Jain monks it also has a depiction of Kaling War. It is a double storied building. It is very near to the capital city of Bhuvneshwar. Next, it is a reference point for studying the Vajrayan Buddhism. Next, it comprises of Rani Gumpha. It comprises of Ganesh Gumpha, which has got importance for the Jain. Then Rani Gumpha, then the Hathi Gumpha, in which the King Kharvela's inscriptions has been written. So this is about Udaygiri Cave, also asked in the UPSC prelims examination and important for art and culture. Now let me take you through world's first republic nation which was led by blacks. This is the Heti Republic. It is located in an island, in an island which is known as Hispaniola Island which was previously colonized by the French and later on when they became independent in 1804 that is when they got the independence. It shares border with just one country and that one country is Dominion Republic. As you can see, it shares border, the western border with Dominion Republic. Where is it situated? It is situated in the Caribbean Sea. So therefore, it is a part of Caribbean islands. Now, it is situated basically between the Caribbean Sea and the North Atlantic Ocean, which you should also know. Now, why Haiti has been in news? Because of a lot of rebel groups which are causing violence in this region and it is getting support from multiple uh, national security forces. So, that is why because of the unrest over here, Haiti has been news, a very important place in news for you. So, we know that cervical cancer has gained a lot of momentum because of the parliamentarian speech mm -hmm. as well. So, cervical cancer is caused by a lot of diseases, a lot of causative factors, one of the most prominent being the human papilloma virus. It is also one of those kind of cancers which can be very easily treatable if we administer this vaccine in the right time. This vaccine is known as the HPV or the human papilloma virus vaccine. What is the gravity of the situation? Cervical cancer is the fourth most common form of cancer in the world leading to one in all four deaths. When it comes to India, it faces the burden of being the second largest second largest 
country with the cervical cancer share and related mortalities. 99% of the cases are related to the HPV infection and obviously related to sexual transmission. It is one of the most successfully treatable forms of cancer yet taking life of a lot of women because they were not aware of the vaccines, not administered on time and also not incorporated into our vaccination programs. What are these vaccines? Let's have a look. The Cervarix, the Gardasil, the Cervavac and the Gardasil 9. Basically, depending upon the spectrum of the viruses in which they attack, they are differentiated. But these are the vaccines which are the human papilloma virus vaccines. And our last topic of the day is the special mention account part 2. What are they? Well, basically, these are substandard kind of assets which can show bad asset quality. Why are we calling it asset? Basically, these are the loans. Some accounts which have taken the loans from the bank. Loans are an asset to the bank because eventually they are going to get principal and they are going to get the interest back from them. It is going to give them the profit. Whereas the currency that they issue, the savings and the current account that they maintain, they are bank's liability. But these are the assets. But what if there is no promise of repaying of principal and interest? And in that case, the quality of the, star of the asset starts getting eroded. Whether it is eroding or whether it has massively degraded that depends upon the classification which we are going to read so basically if i talk about the classification of the quality of loan given by bank they will be classified broadly into the standard assets and the non-performing or the substandard assets so please remember if you have taken a loan and if you are able to repay the principal and the interest on time then that will be considered as a standard asset because there is no delay in repayment if let's say there is a delay of 0 to 30 days then that is classified as a special mention account because it is showing me some of the symptoms of having poor asset quality if this delay is of 31 to 60 days, then this is considered or classified into SMA 1 category, special mention account category 1. If it is further, if it is further delayed by 61 days, but not more than 90 days, then it is classified as SMA account 2. And this is a very critical situa situation to be because in case a person is not able to repay the amount or the principal or the interest of SMA, it will eventually end into the NPA or the non-performing assets. Non-performing assets are those assets which have not been paid by more than 90 days. If a loan has remained unpaid or has remained into the category of NPA for less than 12 months, it is considered as a substandard asset. If it remains as an NPA for more than 12 months, that is one year, it is considered as a doubtful asset, very difficult to be recovered. And if it is finally declared that it is unrecoverable, non-recoverable, then it is classified as a loss asset. So now I hope you've understood what is substandard asset, what is a non-performing asset, what is a standard asset and you must also know what is a twin balance sheet problem. Twin balance sheet means the balance sheet of both the sectors that is the private players and the public players both are in weak positions. So which means both are suffering from a lot of NPAs. So what happens generally if a corporate house, corporate house is suffering from poor, poor asset quality, poor loan quality, has got a lot of NPAs, it would be going to the public sector banks for supporting it. But what if the public sector bank also is suffering from the same problem? Then it creates a very bad situation for the economy, which is considered as or called as a twin balance sheet problem. So this was all about today's session. I hope you have enjoyed it. Do not forget to do the quiz as well for active recalling. Thank you so much and have a nice day.